Throughout the space race, amateur radio operators from all over the world attempted to eavesdrop on American and Soviet missions, creating their own equipment out of secondhand radios, used pipes, and even chicken wire. In contrast, official government equipment cost millions of dollars in construction and maintenance alone. For Italian radio enthusiasts Achille and Giovanni Giudico Cordelia, their hobby took over most of their life. After building their own radio tower in their parents' land, they intercepted communications from both American and Soviet missions. On November 28, 1960, Achille and Giovanni intercepted a sudden Soviet transmission. The brothers were astonished, as the USSR had not announced any mission. And instead of random beeping or technical conversations, it was a call for help. This message was the first in a series of calls that led to a conspiracy theory that had become one of the Cold War's biggest mysteries. The possibility that the Soviet Union concealed failed manned missions from the rest of the world. A Family Affair In 1949, while driving with their family in Lake Como, radio enthusiasts Achille and Giovanni John Giudico Cordelia stumbled upon a group of American military men selling surplus radio equipment at five cents a pound. Then 16 and 10 years old, the brothers acquired 300 pounds to build their own home radio devices. They were soon conversing with newfound friends from all over the world through several frequencies. In 1957, when the Soviet Union launched Sputnik 1, the world's first artificial satellite, the siblings, now in their 20s and with more knowledge than ever before, gathered in their radio room to find the frequency. After searching for a while, they heard a weak but unmistakable sound, a beeping coming from outer space. In an interview with Vice decades later, John recalled the experience, quote, My God, it was unbelievable. We were the first people in all of Europe to listen to the signal of Sputnik 1. After defeat, the brothers' fascination with listening to missions frequencies became more than a simple hobby. They would spend countless days and nights tinkering with their equipment, filling their parents' home with homemade antennas. The brothers kept listening to transmissions from every new space launch mission from either the Soviet Union or the United States. They even captured live streams from missions such as Sputnik 2 or America's first artificial satellite, Explorer 1, in 1958. As John recalled in the Vice interview, quote, There was a new world out there, and we wanted to be a part of it. Torre Bert In 1959, the Giudica Cordelia household moved to the outskirts of Turin in northwestern Italy, where the family had purchased a 16th century villa. The brothers installed their listening equipment in an old bunker within their land and spent the winter of 1960 inside the shed, perfecting their apparatus. They christened their station as Torre Bert, short for Villa Berta Zona, the original building's name. Achille was in medical school, but spent all his free time inside the bunker, while John took up engineering classes to better understand the material. They would listen to conversations between cosmonauts and ground stations for mere seconds as the spacecraft hovered over Turin. With the Sputnik program in full swing, and because of Italy's proximity to the inherently secretive Russia, the brothers decided to concentrate their efforts in the Soviet Union's cosmonaut missions. Still, they had more ambitious goals in mind. The siblings wanted to improve the radio tower, listen to each mission for a more extended period, and begin tracking satellites. To achieve these objectives, they needed a movable dish antenna that would follow objects across the sky and be able to pick up even the faintest of electronic signals from space. While global governments spent millions of dollars on elaborate transmission devices, the young Judica Cordelia students had no choice but to build their own. The brothers looked in junkyards for pipes to build the antenna's framework, a steering wheel to move the device, and truck bearings to carry the massive project. After months of effort, they had also built other equipment such as screens to follow the device's movement, and a listening console with recorders to tape messages from the passing satellites. Although the brothers lacked substantial funding to buy technical journals or hire an expert, the young space enthusiasts built a filtering device to screen out unwanted noises, and came up with a method to determine the frequency of six different Russian tracking stations. Lost Soviet Cosmonauts On November 28, 1960, Achille and Giovanni intercepted a strange Soviet transmission. The brothers were puzzled at first, as there had not been a public launch announcement. Instead of random beeping, as they usually heard from the other satellites, they caught an SOS call in Morse code. Three dots, three dashes, and three dots were transmitted from a spacecraft seemingly moving away from Earth. By this point in time, the Soviet Union had already launched a dog into space. Still, no nation had sent a human beyond the Earth's stratosphere. According to Giovanni's interview with Vice, both brothers were confused. Quote, Maybe the Soviets had managed to launch a cosmonaut into orbit, but they'd lost them into space. We had no proof but it was the only theory that seemed to fit. Why would an unmanned craft transmit a distress signal? Three days after the SOS call, Russia admitted that the recent launch had failed, but did not mention that a human had been aboard the capsule. 
This was only the first in a series of mysterious media calls the brothers intercepted over the years, a theory that became known as the Lost Soviet Cosmonauts. In February of 1981, Torebert again intercepted a strange wordless signal. The noises resembled the racing beat of an overexerted heart and labored breathing sounds. The siblings took the recording to famed heart surgeon Dr. A. Dorliati, whose verdict was that the noises belonged to a dying man. Three months later, the brothers intercepted another unsettling call, in which the voices of two men and one woman could be heard desperately screaming, quote, Conditions growing worse. Why don't you answer? We are going slower. The world will never know about us. The transmission then ended abruptly. Alaskan and Swedish radio interceptors also picked up this distress signal, but neither knew their real purpose. During the time of these recordings, the Soviet Union announced their first successful human crewed mission, in which Yuri Gagarin orbited the Earth. And on June 14, 1963, they recorded a female voice that allegedly belonged to cosmonaut Valentina Tereshkova. The brothers claimed it was recorded two days before the official launch date provided by the Soviets. The Judica Cordelia siblings were convinced that these calls pointed to the Soviets launching people into space, losing them to accidents, and covering it up. A visit to NASA. Torre Bert was more rudimentary than many nations' official space displays. Still, the Judica Cordelias had exceptional knowledge that far exceeded other home radio listeners. In 1964, the siblings won a space quiz TV contest, earned $3,000, and immediately spent the money on a trip to America. With help from scientists such as Dr. Walter Ramberg, they visited NASA and arranged a meeting with space communication specialists. While in NASA, the brothers played tapes that they had recorded of John Glenn's conversations with Capsule Communication, recorded during the Friendship 7 mission in 1962. American officials were astounded. Harry J. Gett, the Goddard Space Flight Center director, told their translator that they had done a remarkable job, but that he was worried that amateurs had been able to access secret working frequencies. When the scientists asked the brothers how they had determined the specific frequency in the L-band, they answered, quote, Easy. We saw a pre-flight picture of the Glenn capsule, and we figured out the frequency from the size of the capsule antenna. The response convinced NASA officials of the brothers' capabilities and made a deal with them. The scientists would give them two NASA frequencies in exchange for two of their acquired Russian ones. Zeus Network As Torre Bert became more complex, the brothers realized that they would need more hands to operate it. They recruited over a dozen space enthusiasts and asked their younger sister, Maria Teresa, to learn Russian to translate messages from the crewed Soviet flights. Giovanni also recruited his girlfriend, Laura Furbato, to enlist other amateur space fans and build the Zeus Network, a worldwide organization formed of global space fanatics. The Brothers Network eventually forecasted, 12 hours before the fact, that the Soviet Lunik 4 launch to the moon would miss its target by 5,000 miles. A year after its foundation, the Zeus Network had 17 stations spread all over the planet. The Last Recording On March 18, 1965, the Judica Cordelia siblings recorded cosmonaut Alexei Leonov's voice as he performed the first spacewalk in history. Although the Russians hid the fact that Leonov's suit had suffered a malfunction, Giovanni and Akile informed NASA of the error. Leonov's mission was the last of their controversial Soviet recordings. On July 20th, 1969, 12 years after they first recorded the Sputnik 1's beeping sounds, the brothers intercepted the moon landing. This event marked the end of the brothers' two-decade intriguing exposés, as the moon landing was televised for the entire world and interest in radio broadcasting dwindled. After the 1969 mission, the U.S. was perceived as the winner of the space race, and both nations turned their focus to nuclear matters. By 1966, the brothers had dismantled Torre Bert. The Zeus network eventually stopped growing as the siblings turned their attention towards other studies and their families. Achille became a prestigious cardiologist, and John became a famed forensic scientist who worked with the Italian police for decades. The brothers have always insisted that the true purpose of Torre Bert was not to unmask secret Soviet missions, but rather to pursue their passion for technology and homemade equipment. Whether the brothers intercepted distress calls were misunderstood due to language barriers, or if they really belonged to cosmonauts in peril, the truth still remains as one of many secrets from the now-defunct Soviet Union. Mm -hmm.